thank you, thank you all for coming on this gorgeous evening and when many of you are concerned about immediate problems of flooding, your own flooding or helping others with their flooding, uh, there was already in Hiroshima a ceremony with 50,000 people commemorating the bombing of Hiroshima and other ceremonies around the world. This is very timely. We have the movie of Oppenheimer now being shown and we have some uh, threats about nuclear arms in the war in Ukraine. So the bombing and the flooding are not entirely unrelated. Bombing is a result of our inability to live in harmony with other human beings. And the flooding and climate change is a result of our inability to live in harmony with nature. The most horrendous act of war ever perpetrated was by the United States in 1945 when we dropped the first atomic bomb on the civilian population of Hiroshima on August 6th and the second bomb on Nagasaki three days later. The estimates vary hundreds of thousands, 200,000 let's say Humans were instantly incinerated in those bombings. It's hard to get my mind around what does 200,000 mean? Well, this is what it means in Vermont if everyone in the following cities, every single person was killed in Burlington, Essex, South Burlington, Bennington, Colchester, Rutland, Brattleboro, Winooski, Barrie, Montpelier, St. Albans, Newport, Bellows Falls, Morrisville, Lindenville, Virgin, Swanton, and my little town of Plainfield. That comes close to the human death toll in 1945. The weapons that we have today are much more powerful than the bomb we had then. And other countries are working on nuclear warheads and on more sophisticated methods of deploying them. As the UN Secretary General said, the, bomb, the drums of nuclear war are being beating once again. This ceremony is something we are all creating together. As we walk peacefully together down once flooded State Street, as we speak together, as we listen together, as we sing together, as we share our commitments to peace. We hope this evening we will together create an experience of peace, starting with our meditative walking. An experience of peace that does not deny fear and grief. We have to embrace fear and grief and not push them aside. We're living with them. We will be walking silently down State Street, pausing in front of Christ Church where the bell will toll 78 times for each year since the bombing. 
The bell rings at exactly 7.15, the time the bomb was dropped. We then continue walking to the high school where we will form a circle and first thing will be a reading of stories from Hibakusha, survivors of the bombing. And we will need four volunteers to read, each one of them to read one of these short stories from Hibakusha. So Joseph is right there. He has copies of the stories. If you will raise your hand, if you volunteer to read one. There's one volunteer. They're, they're numbered because there's a, a certain logic to the sequence. Two more volunteers. Number, says it on the reading number three. And one more person. Thank you. Just, just to mention yes. that between each of the readings, after you have read, someone will be saying three short words of prayers. So give time for that before the next reading. Yes. And after that, we will all be invited to share what is in our hearts and minds about peace and war. Stories of peacemaking, even the smallest ways of peacemaking with neighbors or family can give encouragement to work for peace. We, we learn also from our failed attempts to create peace, and from our failure to risk making peace. Then Rick and his friend George will be leading us in peace songs, and finally we will each take a flower from this beautiful Vietnamese made basket, and we can't go down to the river as we have in the past. The river is blocked with trees that were came down with the flood and mud. But we will stand in our circle and each person hold a flower and make a commitment to do something, however small but doable, in the coming year to help create peace. And you can be thinking about that in advance if you wish. And now Mary will talk about... Do I have to get in front of the mic? I don't know. That would be great if you could. Uh, welcome. Uh, we begin, this is a commemoration of, of, of the, probably the greatest act of state-sponsored terrorism on the history of the planet. As Glenda said, thousands upon thousands of people died immediately, to say nothing of many more who died subsequent to August 6, 1945. But I'm also here to introduce an age-old practice called walking meditation. And as we walk, we have the capacity, the opportunity to manifest peace and love in every step that we take, just as kind of a, a prayer in motion. This was taught by the Buddha and certainly taught for decades by my teacher, Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. So we walk in reverence for the dead 
and, and the injured. But we also walk for our planet, the most, this most beautiful, precious planet that we all call home. So again, we're walking in, in reverence and in memory. With each step that we take, we, can, we have the opportunity to caress the earth. We touch the earth very, very gently. We're not walking to get somewhere. We're not walking to burn calories. We're not walking to be at a certain destination at a certain time with a sense of rush and hurry. It might be hard to understand, but something as simple as walking has a great impact on the health of the earth, as peculiar as it sounds. So tonight, for the next 40 minutes, we're going to walk in peace with very, very gentle, gentle steps. With each step, we come into the, into the here and the now. Not in the future, not in the past, but into the present. We bring all our attention to the soles of our feet. That's where we, that's where we become, that is the focus and, and the center of our attention. We, we become aware of how our feet contact the earth and the fluid motion of our feet. And although indeed we are moving, in another sense, we have stopped. We have stopped our worry, hopefully, and our fears. Each step, we have the opportunity to manifest peace and gratitude for this most precious, for this most beautiful planet that we call our home. It, I, I always regard walking meditation as, as a, a, a sort of a prayer, a much, much more meaningful prayer that I learned than that that I learned in Catholic grade school. Um, this is a silent walk. We turn off any devices. We, are com we have to uh, keep to the sidewalks because we don't have something called a parade permit. Um, I think Glenda well described the route. We have a couple of crosswalks that we will negotiate. Um, we'll cross State Street um, headed toward Christ Episcopal Church. Um, and then when we stop, when the bells toll and we all stop, it's an opportunity to offer, a, in the spirit of a meditation, contemplation, or a prayer, that this horrific act is never, ever repeated. What, whatever language spirituality speaks to us, we offer a prayer of, to, to the universe. Um, I think that Glenda covered a lot of the, the, the timing. The bell at Christ Church will be, it will sound the bells at 7.15. As I understood the original time when the bomb was dropped, it was 8.15 in the morning, Hiroshima time. But this is an, a, the adjusted time. Um, and then we all resume walking down, down State Street to Montpelier High School for the formation of another circle. And I, I truly hope um, that you find this a meaningful experience. And strange, strangely enough, we also we walk in a spirit of what I would call paradox. Um, in each step, we call to mind the tragedy, 
but then we also, the joy of being alive as a human being. So we're walking as kind of an exercise in paradox. Life is full of paradox. So I truly hope that this is a meaningful experience. Walking is something we do every day. And it is very simple to take this experience and, you know, grocery store, at home, anywhere, walking in the woods, anywhere. It's, for me, it's a, it's a very, I call it a holy experience. So I hope that you all enjoy it. And um, we will see one another very soon at the high school. So we will follow the banner and walk it. I'm driving.
tolls for D. Welcome again. You've all heard that before. The ceremony today has several different parts and I will just go over them and make sure that we're all on the same page. So the sequence of events is that we're going to start with statements by Hiroshima, sub, uh, Hiroshima survivors with a Japanese called Hibakusha. And there'll be five statements and after each one is read, there'll be three meta prayers, which are short Buddhist prayers of peace following each statement. And then the next person will go. You should have on the sheet of paper I gave you the number of reading that you're reading, one, two, three, four, five. After the last prayer is said, I'm going to ask for a moment of silence so we can take in 
everything that has been said. And then Rick Pagliari, and I'm sorry, I don't... George Mann, who has graciously come, he's on tour with a musician's group throughout this region, and Rick and he came together to perform some songs for us relevant to the occasion. And then Glenda has a poem that she wrote that is very fitting for this occasion. And then there'll be the flower ceremony. And each of you will be asked if you should show choose to share your thoughts about this occasion or anything else that came up for you during the walk or anything that you feel is relevant for the occasion. We ask you to be brief, but speak from the heart, of course. That's a voluntary effort. No one has to do it. For those of you who will be speaking, we ask you to come up here. We had hoped to have a remote mic, but the remote mic won't work, so we have to, you have to be near here to be able to be heard by everyone. People want to close in a little bit, that'd be great. And then I'll have a few closing words, very brief, and not mostly not my own. And then we'll have some closing music. I think Rick is going to be playing his flute to send us off on our way. So we'll start off with these are actual statements by people who survived the bombing of Hiroshima, who were there mostly as young people. So we'll start off with the first one. This reading is by Rieko Yamada. On August 6th, the day when Hiroshima was attacked with an atomic bomb, the hot midsummer sun was blazing down since early morning, and no cloud could be seen in the sky. We got to school at 8 and lined up in rows on the schoolyard for the flag signaling drill. As food was scarce those days and children were not fed sufficiently, many fainted one after another under the scorching sun. Eventually, we were told to rest for a while in the shade of the trees. Boys who remained in the middle of the playground shouted, Look! A B-29 pointed at the sky. Around that time, U.S. B-29 bombers often flew over the city. Wherever they came, an air raid alert siren sounded. So a B-29 was a familiar sight to children. I looked up and saw the silver shining B-29 plane flying high in the high blue sky, drawing a white arc with its vapor trails. That's pretty, I thought. The next moment I felt a white flash. As I began to rush for the air raid shelter, the hot sand from the sandbox grew strong against my back and pushed me, now, pushed me down on the ground. When we reached the shelter with my schoolmates, it was already crowded with people from the neighboring areas, and there was no room left for us. Soon we got drenched from the sudden rain, which we later learned to be the radioactive black rain. We colored up to keep ourselves warm, but we were shivering with cold. The sun looked to be gone, with heavy gray clouds hanging over the sky. The following verses are taken from um, the Metta Sutra, taught by the Buddha, and um, when practiced in a spirit of love, will take the mind to the four highest abodes, heavenly abodes. These are the three verses. May you, may we, be free and at peace in body, 
and mind and spirit. May you be healthy and safe. May you, may we be healthy and safe and free from all harm. May you, may we be held in love that is boundless. This statement is by Junko Watanabe. On August 6, 1945, at 8.15, my mom was at home with my younger brother. My elder brother and I were playing in the yard of a temple near my home. Then my mother felt a strong wind, a terrible wind, and she saw burnt papers falling in front of our home. My mom was surprised, and she came to get us at the temple. At that moment, the black rain began. The rain was black and sticky. Before the bomb was launched that August 6th, the weather was nice in the morning, and they say that the atomic bomb exploded 580 meters above the Earth. Then, since it exploded high above, it does more damage with its hot rays and hot wind, which burn people. After the bomb exploded, all the dust and papers flew upwards, and then came the black rain with radiation. After being exposed to the black rain, my body had this condition. I suffered from diarrhea every day. I could eat, but no nutrients remained in my body. They all were lost, everything that I ate. My parents thought their daughter would die. In fact, I was only two years old, and I cannot recall any disastrous scenes. I, being a survivor, it fortunately had no physical problems, although there are many doctors who say that the effect of the radiation also shows up in future generations. May all beings be well. May all beings be safe and know an end to fear. May all beings be at ease. Koji Ueda, Hiroshima survivor. There are three Hubakachi, Kabakachi, in my family, namely my mother, my sister, and me. My mother, who was 26 years old at the time, rescued the injured victims and escaped from the bomb city carrying my two-year-old sister on her back. My mother often told me that the scene at the time was not the scene of something on Earth. The swollen faces could not be recognized due to the burns with 20 to 100 centimeters burned skin dangling down from the tops of the fingers. When we offered our hands to the injured persons for help, their skin peeled off. Since there was neither medicine nor doctors, the only thing my mother could do was repeatedly was to wash the wounds with water and wipe them. Due to the hot summer, our wounds were infected with maggots and the maggots had to be taken off with chopsticks. What the rescue persons could do was only to speak helpless, encouraging words. The corpses of the victims who died one after another were gathered in a dry riverbed and burned by pouring gasoline on them. Among such corpses put in the fire were those who were still breathing. They burst into yelling and finally passed away. May you, may we, be free and at peace in body, mind, and spirit. May you, may we, be healthy, safe, and strong, and free from all harm. May you, may we, be held in a love 
that is boundless. I can't pronounce the name, but I'll do my best. Toyoko Koabara, Hiroshima survivor. On August 6th, students were helping clean up the site of a building that had been demolished to create a fire-free zone in the event of bombing raids. While Chiyoko was resting under a large camphor tree because of her stomach pain, she heard someone say, there's a plane overhead. Though she was 800 meters, about half a mile, from the hypo center, she didn't see the flash and was thrown unconscious into a large hole where she was covered with debris. debris. After regaining consciousness, she struggled desperately out of the hole. Three friends appeared out of the gloomy darkness. Chiyoko, you're alive, but what a terrible injury. That's when she first realized that the skin on her head and forehead was burned and had fallen away, sticking to her face. Her hands were also burned, and, her, and their skin was left dangling. Even though it was still morning, it was so dark that they couldn't see a thing. Once she was able to see again, Chiyoko saw people walking with their skin hanging down, their faces swollen, and their bodies burned. Old people had been put on stretchers and then left behind. May all beings attune within. May all beings listen for the cries of the world. May all beings' kind intentions be realized. Shigeko Sasamori. Shigeko Sasamori San was 13 years old when the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Hearing the sound of a plane, she looked up to see a B-59 flying overhead. Seconds later, she was knocked unconscious by the blast. When she came to, she was so badly burned that she was unrecognizable. Shigeko repeated her name and address over and over until she was finally found by her father. Years later, she would travel to the United States in 1955 as part of a group of young women known as the Hiroshima Maidens. While in New York, she underwent went numerous plastic surgery operations. May you, may we be free and at peace in our body, mind, and spirit. May you, and may we, be healthy, safe, and free from all harm. May you, may we, be held in a love that is boundless. I would like to invite each of you, if you choose to, to share your thoughts and feelings if you would come up to the mic. And we ask that after each person has spoken, we give them a moment of silence to think about what they have said. So, 
So I, I was actually born uh, August 8th, 1945. And as you can tell, it still uh, resonates with me. Um, however, I think, uh, you know, it was said earlier that what we're involved in is very paradoxical. It's very tragic. And yet somehow we need to uh, find joy or happiness. And uh, I think that my life was lived that way. As I grew up and, and you know, read history and understood the end of the war, uh, it just seemed so tragic. And yet, uh, when I would talk to my mother about it, she thought it was a wonderful day. She was so, uh, so happy for, for, for me to come into the world, but also for the war to be ended. And I think that's what we live with. And I think it was so good to have the prayers following, you know, the very tragic stories. I want to thank the people who ran the service at the library. It was very moving. I appreciated their including the, the climate issue and its relation to war, or implied that. Um, climate creates the conditions which create war. Preparing for war creates the conditions for climate change. We need to be both peace activists and climate change activists. I think the stories we just heard of the, from the survivors of the bombs are very important. Uh, we often hear of the great destruction and the immediate deaths, but we also need to be aware that many survived the initial attacks but suffered, suffered greatly immediately and for years and years afterward. Um, I have a calligraphy in my kitchen and when there were more of us it was by it's by Thich Nhat Hanh. It was a entryway there was a huge amount of mud coming in the door a lot of kids um, the calligraphy says no mud no lotus as we know the lotus is one of the most beautiful flowers on the earth and it grows out of mud as we're walking down state street i've been doing walking meditation in the early morning hours for a month or so there's been a lot of mud, and more recently, a lot of silt, less so today. And I like to keep hope alive in my heart. I think there's a great capacity in this community, the generation, younger generation, the youth, to grow many, many more lotuses, a culture of peace. And I was very moved during the flood, all of the goodwill in the community 
largely young people, but people of all generations, the generosity. So I think this is a special community, and I really, I hope in my heart, and I, that, again, that we, um, we help the fostering of many, many future generations of um, lotuses in, in our youth. Um, very grateful to live in this, in this community. I wanted to find a peacemaking story to share, but the only peacemaking story that came to mind was a story about inner peacemaking. We're concerned now about disarmament, nuclear disarmament. But there is also inner disarmament. And at a time when I was accused of actions that were not so, I immediately became defensive. And of course, wanted to attack, wanted to prove myself right. Uh, I was picking up my sword and shield, and we would be sitting. You have to stand behind. Sorry, dear. Oh, okay. I should have told you that. Uh, so, I realized that my sword was my anger, my aggressiveness, wanting to get back, wanting to prove myself right, and that my shield was self-protectiveness. And that in order to have inner peace, I needed to lay down that sword of aggressiveness and lay down that shield of self-protectiveness. and be open and be more peaceful. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to have some songs. Gentlemen. Thank you. 
down my sword and shield down by the riverside down by the riverside get the right key right well, let's Jeez. try that again okay. all right I'm gonna lay my sword and shield down by the riverside down by the riverside song that uh, he's going to share with you. Yeah, well, one uh, in keeping with the spirits of today. It's really meant to be played on piano, but couldn't bring the piano today, and you don't want to hear me play piano anyway. <laughs> I'll show you, you know the words. Imagine I'm a dreamer, but I'm 
not the only one I hope someday you join us And the world will live as one Imagine no possession This is a song that you all know. And, uh, you know, both George and I have worked together with Pete Seeger, and uh, that's one of the reasons that George is here. We're going to be doing a special concert uh, over in uh, Johnson. On Tuesday night. On yeah, Tuesday night. Weekly concert on the green. That's why I came up so we could sing some of these old songs from Pete and Woody and the Almanac singers. Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. It doesn't rain, right? And, uh, one of the things about about Pete, uh, when he, he wrote this song about where have all the flowers gone, usually when they talk about the song, they talk about that it, you know, he got inspired by reading this Quiet Flows the Dawn, which a lot of times back in the old days that people would just attribute that to the Soviet Union. But of course, if you look at where the Dawn River is, it's in the Ukraine. It's in Ukraine. So this song is actually from Ukraine. And I uh, and we have all the flowers gone. Long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? Young girls pick them everyone. When will they ever? Where have all the graveyards gone? Long time. 
to flowers everyone when will we ever learn when will we ever where have all I'd just like to say that I'm here as I usually am because of my wife's mother, Crystal Holzer, who uh, Joseph Gainza spent many time standing in line. And today, you noticed I was carrying a banner. Now, jo Joseph, uh, Joseph, you remember that banner, don't you? She carried that banner with her for so many years uh, that we were together and we stood together and sang together. And uh, we have time for one more song if you want it. Oh, you put your guitar away? Yes. Oh, take it, take it back out, George. This is a song, uh, one of the last times that I can remember Crystal standing, holding that banner. We were in Burlington. I mean, you might have been there. Do you remember when Utah Phillips was there, standing with us? In Burlington? Yeah, Utah Phillips was right there, and Crystal, and I think Cy Khan might have been there too. Uh, and we were all together. And this is a song that, uh, that Utah uh, wrote, and it's a good thing for us to think about right now, uh, because the times are hard, and uh, it's in the key of D. Sometimes in this living, it gets so dark and lonesome Seems like there's nothing we can do So we reach out to each other to Raise a song together And sing a song to carry us through Of course, we are singing through the hard times Singing through the hard times Working for the good times to come Singing through the hard times, singing through the hard times, working for the good times to come. We are singing through the hard times, singing through the hard times, working for the good times to come. And when the war clouds gather, it's so easy to get angry and just as hard not to be afraid but you know in your own heart no matter what happens you can't turn your back and walk away we are singing through the hard times singing through the hard times light of peace in us every day if we could learn to live it walk and talk and give it that light of peace won't be so far away we are singing through the hard times the heart.
times, singing through the hard times, working for the good times to come. We are singing through the hard times, singing through the hard times. Thank you so much. Rick, did you write that song? Utah. So Utah. Utah sang. Utah wrote that song. Great. Okay, coming up next, Glenda has a poem that she would like to share with us. A couple of weeks or so ago when I was feeling I had really hit the bottom with everything that was going on, including some deaths of people I knew. I wrote, and I looked out the window and I saw my flower garden, and I wrote this poem. There are not enough tears to shed for the victims of the floods, and my lilies are blooming with abandon. There is not enough grief to mourn the victims of the Hiroshima bombing we remember again. And my flocks are spreading their fragrance. There is not enough compassion to soothe the suffering of David Hill and Ann Kilmer. And my snapdragons are bursting like technicolor pups. I am brought low by the sorrows of the world, and my golden glows are reaching their yellow sprays up to the sky. I am here, say the snapdragons, and flocks, and lilies, and golden glows. I am here now, just now. Now we have a flower ceremony. There are the flowers. Would somebody like to describe the ceremony? Okay, so each person will be asked to take one and make a vow of how they will advance peace in the coming year in any way that you might be able to think of. We can't pass the mic, so if you do wish to say something, you have to come up here. Or you can speak loudly from where you stand. Pardon? Or you can make the vow to yourself. Thank you.
lives. last 45 years a peace activist and be a good role model for my grandchildren that they may carry peace in their hearts and peace wherever they go as role models for the next generations. I vow to promote peace in the classroom in this coming school year with the children amongst them and, to, and into the greater world. I live in a building that can be somewhat anonymous. People pass in the halls um, without really seeing each other. I vow in the coming year to, um, to be more present, to practice being more present with the people I encounter. So in closing, I've been asked to say a few words, and I'm going to read mostly what I have to say, but walking through Montpelier this evening, I'm sure every one of us experienced the grief of what we saw in front of us. Compared to what happened in Hiroshima, this is a relatively minor tragedy but not for those whose lives were disrupted by losing their homes, losing their businesses, everything they've worked for for years and years. So this is a tragedy in our midst as we commemorate the larger tragedy of the destruction of the people of Hiroshima and in three days, the people of Nagasaki. So I thought it would be fitting to finish with some words of a Hibakusha who survived Hiroshima and spent the rest of her life working for peace and in fact received the Nobel Peace Prize for her efforts. And in her acceptance speech, her name, by the way, is Suduko Thurlow. She married a Westerner, Suduko Thurlow. And in her speech, her acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize, she related her own experience surviving Hiroshima and how that happened. And here were her closing words. Our light now is the ban treaty, the international treaty to ban nuclear weapons, which has been signed by more than 100 nations of the world, none of whom, of course, are nuclear weapons powers. But yet it is still a sign of hope that this international treaty is now in the world banning nuclear weapons. This is the efforts that she was involved in and for which she received the Nobel Prize. So I'll start again. Our light now is the ban treaty. To tell all in this hall and all listening around the world, I repeat those words that I heard call to me in the ruins of Hiroshima. Don't give up. Keep pushing. See the light, crawl towards it. 
No matter what obstacles we face, we will keep moving and keep pushing and keep sharing this light with others. This is our passion and commitment for our one precious world to survive. Good night.